Live from Midtown Manhattan, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data New York City 2017. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media and its ecosystem sponsors. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in New York City for the week. Three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Big Data NYC. It's Big Data Week here in conjunction with Strata Hadoop, Strata Data, which is an event running right around the corner. It's theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Peter Burris. Our next guest is Jacques Estac, who's the head of data at Pivotal. Uh, welcome to theCUBE, good to see you again. Likewise. So you guys had big news uh, we covered at VMworld, obviously the Kubernetes craze is fantastic. You're starting to see cloud native platforms front and center, even in some of the operational worlds like in cloud. Data, you guys have been here for a while with, with Greenplum and now Pivotal's been adding more to the data suite. So you guys are a player in this ecosystem. Correct. As it grows to be much more developer centric and enterprise centric and AI centric, what's the update? So, so I'd like to talk about a couple things, just three quick things here. Uh, one focused primarily on simplicity. And so first and foremost, as you said, you know, there's a lot of things going on on the Cloud Foundry side, a lot of things that we're doing with Kubernetes, et cetera, super exciting. Um, I will say Tony Baer just wrote a nice piece about um, Greenplum in ZDNet, essentially calling Greenplum the best kept secret in the analytic uh, database world. And, and why I think that's important is what isn't really well known is that over the period of Pivotal's history now, the last four and a half years, we focused um, really heavily on the Cloud Foundry side, on DevOps, on, on getting users to actually be able to, to publish code. Um, what we haven't talked about as much is what we're doing on the data side. And, and I find it very interesting to repeatedly tell analysts and customers that the Greenplum business has been and continues to be a profitable business unit within uh, Pivotal. And so as, as we're growing on the Cloud Foundry side, we're continuing to grow a, a business that many of the, of the organizations that I see here at Strata are still looking to get to, that, that ever, ever forgotten uh, profitability zone. <laughs> <coughs> so, so then. Uh, How about his legacy around Greenplum? I'm not going to say they pivoted, and, uh, <laughs> pun intended, pivotal. Um, you've, there's been added stuff around Greenplum. So Greenplum might have get lost in, in the messaging because it's been now one of many ingredients. Right? It, it's true, and when we formed Pivotal, I think there were 34 or some different SKUs that we have now uh, focused in on over the last you know, two years or so. And what's, what's super exciting is, again, kind of over that time period, one of the things that we took um, to heart within the Greenplum side is this idea of extreme agile. And so, as you guys know, yeah. Pivotal mm -hmm. Labs being a core part of the, the Pivotal mission helps our customers figure out how to actually build software. We finally are drinking our own champagne, and, and over the last year and a half of Greenplum R&D, we're shipping code, like a complete data platform, we're shipping that on a cadence of about four to five weeks, which again, kind of is a little bit unheard of in the industry, being able to, to move at that pace. We work through the backlog, and, and what is also super exciting, and I'm, I'm glad that you guys are, are able to help me tell the world, we released version five last week. Uh, version five is, actually the only um, parallel open source data platform that actually has native ANSI compliant SQL. And I, I feel a little bit like I've rewound the clock 15 mm -hmm. years where I have to actually throw in the ANSI <laughs> compliance. But I think that in a lot of ways there are SQL uh, alternatives that are out there in, in the world. They are very much not ANSI compliant and, and that hurts. And that, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a nuance, but it's table stakes in the enterprise. It I mean, is. ANSI compliance is just Well, but there's a reason why you want to be ANSI compliance, is because there's a whole swath of uh, analytic applications, mainly in the data warehouse world, that were built using ANSI compliant SQL. SQL. Yeah. So, so why, is, why do this with version five? I presume it's got to have something to do with you want to start capturing some of those applications and helping customers modernize them. That, that is correct. And so I think the SQL piece is one part of the data platform, of, of really a modern data platform. The other parts are, again, becoming table stakes. So being able to do text analytics. So we've baked Apache Solar within Greenplum. You know, being able to do um, graph analytics or spatial analytics, uh, anything from classifications, regressions, all of that actually becomes sort of table stakes. And, and we feel that um, enterprises have suffered a little bit over the last five or six years. They've had this promise of having a new platform that they can leverage you know, for doing interesting new things, machine learning, you know, AI, et cetera. But the existing stuff that they were trying to do has been super, super hard. And so what we're trying to do is bridge those together and provide uh, provide both in the same platform, you know, out of the gate so that customers can actually use it um, 
immediately. And I think you know one of the things that we've seen is there's a about a thousand to one, you know, SQL experienced individuals within an enterprise versus you know like say for for example Hadoop experienced uh, individuals. Uh, the other thing th that I think is is actually super uh, uh, important and almost bigger than everything else I talked about is we're the, so a lot of the, uh, the old school Postgres derivatives of, of MPP databases forked their databases at some point in Postgres's history for a variety of reasons from licensing to when they started. Uh, Greenplum's no different. So we forked you know, right around 8.2. Um, with this uh, last release of version five, we've actually up-leveled the Postgres base within Greenplum to 8.3. Now, in and of itself, it doesn't sound. What does that mean? So, so we are now taking a 100% uh, commitment both to open source and both to the Postgres community. I think if you look at Postgres today in, in its latest versions, it is a full-fledged, mission-critical database that can be used anywhere. And what we feel is that if we can bring our core uh, engineering developments around parallelism, around analytics, and combine that with Postgres itself, then we don't have to implement all of the you know, low-level database things that uh, a lot of our competitors have to have to do, and and what what's unique about it is one, Greenplum continues to be open source, which again most of our competitors are not. Two, if you look at you know primarily what they're doing, nobody's got that level of commitment to the Postgres community, which means all of their resources are going to be stuck building core database technology, even building that ANSI SQL compliance in, which we'll get quote unquote for free which will let us focus on things like machine learning. Just give a quick topics. second to just talk about the relevance of Postgres because of the success. First of all, it's massive, it's everywhere, but it's not going anywhere. <laughs> I mean, just give a quick, uh, for the audience watching, what's the relevance of it? Sure, sure, sure. Like you said, I mean, it is everywhere. It is the most full-featured actual database in the open source community. You know, arguably MySQL has more market share, but, but the MySQL projects that generally leverage them are not used for mission critical you know, enterprise-ish applications. And so, so being able to have parity allows us not only to have that database you know, um, uh, you know, technology baked into Greenplum, but it also gives us all of the community stuff with it. So everything from being able to leverage you know, the, the most recent ODBC and JDBC libraries, but also integrations into everything from you know, the post GIS driver for geospatial to uh, being able to, to connect to other types of data sources, et cetera. Um, so, so. So it's a big community, shows us it's successful, but then again. And it's not, it doesn't come in a red box. It does not come in a red box, that is correct. Which is not a bad thing. But look, uh, Postgres as a technology was developed a long time ago, mm -hmm. largely in response to the need to think about how analytics and transactions analytics and operating applications might eventually come together. And we're now moving into a world where we can actually see the hardware and a lot of the practices, et cetera, are beginning to find ways where this may start to happen. So, you know, I know Green, I know Green Plum and Postgres, both you know, MPP based. So you're, by going to this, you're able to stay more modern, more up to date on all the new technology that's coming together to support these new richer, more complex classes of applications. The, uh, so, so you're spot on. Um, I, I, I suppose I would argue that Postgres, I feel, you know, kind of came up with the, uh, uh, as a response to Oracle in the past of, of, you know, we need an open source alternative to Oracle. But other than that, 100% correct. I think. But there's always a difference between Postgres and, My Postgres and MySQL. Always. My, always. MySQL always was, okay, so that's that. Well, let's do that open source. And Postgres, coming out of Berkeley and coming out of some other places, always had a slightly different notion of the types of problems it was going to take on. 100 percent correct. 100 percent. Um, so, so, but at, you know, to your question before, what does this all mean to, to customers? I think the one thing that version five really gives us the confidence to say is, you know, and and a lot of times I, I hate lobbying the balls out like this, but you know, we welcome and, and embrace with open arms any any Teradata customers out there that are are looking to save, you know, millions if not tens of millions of dollars on a modern platform that can actually run not only on-premise, not only on bare metal, but, but virtually and off-premise. So we're truly the only MPP platform, the only open source MPP data platform that can allow you to build analytics and move those analytics from Amazon to Azure to back on-prem. Talk about this for the Teradata thing for a second. I want to get down to and, and double click on that. Customers don't want to change code. 
There you go. Right. So, what specifically are you guys offering Terradata customers specifically? So, so with the release of version five, with a lot of the development that we've done and some of the partnering that we've done, we are now able to take without changing a line of code of your Teradata applications. You load the data within the Greenplum platform, you can point those applications directly to Greenplum and run them unchanged. And so I think the, in the past, the reticence to move to any other platform was really the amount of time it would take to actually redevelop all of the stuff that you had. <laughs> and so we offer an ability to go from uh, an immediate ROI to a platform that again, kind of bridges that gap, allows you to, to really be modern. Peter, I want to talk to you about that importance of what you just said because we've been you've been studying the private cloud report, sure. true private cloud, which is on premises, moving to a cloud operating model, automating away undifferentiated labor and shipping that to differentiated labor. But this brings up the what customers want in hybrid cloud and, and ultimately having public cloud and private cloud, so hybrid sits there. They don't want to change their code base. This is a huge deal. So I would say a couple things that, to, to build upon what Jock said. The first thing is that uh, you're right. Um, people people want the data to run where the data naturally needs to run or should run, and that's the big argument about public versus hybrid versus what we call true private cloud. The idea that increasingly the workload the workload needs to be located where the data where it naturally should be located because of the physical, legal, regulatory, intellectual property attributes of the data. So being able to do that is really really important. But the other thing that Jock said and it builds right into this question, John, uh, is that ultimately in the, in, in, in too many domains within this analytics world, which is fundamentally predicated in the idea of breaking data out of applications so that you can use it in new and novel and more value-creating ways, is that the data gets locked up in a data warehouse. Sure. And what's valuable in a data warehouse is not the hardware, it's the data. <laughs> and so by providing the facility for uh, being able to point uh, an application at a couple of different data stores, including one that's more modern or takes advantage of more modern technology and can be considerably cheaper, it means that the shop can elevate the story about the asset. And the asset here is the data and the applications that run against it, not the hardware in the system where the data is stored and located. And one of the biggest challenges we talked earlier with one of the, just to go on for a second, we talked earlier with a couple of other guests about the fact that the industry still, or your average user still doesn't understand how to value data, how to establish a data asset. And one of the reasons is because mm -hmm. it's so constantly commingled with the underlying hardware. Silos. Right. Yeah. And actually, I'd, I'd, I'd even further go on. Like, I think the advent of some of these new cloud data warehouses, you know, forgets forgets that notion of being able to kind of run it, you know, in different places, and provides one of the things that customers are really looking for, which is simplicity. You know, like. You know, the ability to spin up a quick MVP SQL system within, say, Amazon, for example, almost, uh, almost without a doubt, a lot of the business users that I speak to are willing to sacrifice capabilities within the platform, which they are, for the simplicity of getting it up and going. And so one of the things that we've really focused on in V5 is, is being able to give that same turnkey feel. And so Greenplum exists within the Amazon marketplace, within the Azure marketplace, uh, Google uh, later this quarter. And then, um, you know, in addition to the simplicity, it has all of the functionality that is missing in those platforms. So again, kind of all the analytics, all the ability to reach out and federate queries against different types of data. You know, I think it's, it's exciting as we continue to progress in, in, our, uh, in our releases. You know, Greenplum has for a number of years had this ability to seamlessly query uh, HDFS. Again, like a lot of the competitors. Um, but but you know HDFS isn't going away. Neither is uh, generic object store like S3. But we continue to extend that to things like uh, Spark, for example. And so now the ability to actually house your data within a data platform and seamlessly integrate with Spark back and forth. If you want to use Spark, use Spark. But somewhere that data needs to be uh, materialized so that other applications can actually leverage it as well. But even then, people have been saying, well, if you want to put it on this disk, then put it on this disk. Even the question about Spark versus some other database manager is a higher level conversation than many of the shops who are investing millions and millions and millions of dollars in their analytic application portfolio. And all you're trying to do, is, as I interpret it, is trying to say, look, the value in the portfolio is the applications and the, and the, and the data, it's not the underlying elements. There's a whole bunch of new elements that we can use. You can put it in the cloud, you can 
put it on premise if that's where the data belongs. You can use some of these new and evolving technologies, but you're focused on how the data and the applications continue to remain valuable to the business over time and not the traditional hardware assets. Correct, and, and I will, I'll again kind of leverage a, uh, a notion that we get from labs, which is this, uh, this idea of user-centric design. And so everything that we've been putting into the, the Greenplum database is around, you know, ideally the four primary users of our, of our system. Not just the analysts, and not just the data scientists, but also the operators and the IT folks. Right. And that, that is, is where I'd say the last tenant of, of where we're going really is this idea of co-opetition. And so, you know, I would, as the pivotal Greenplum guy that's been around for, you know, 10 plus years, I would tell you very, very straight up that we are, again, an open source MPP data platform that can rival any other platform out there, whether it's Teradata, whether it's Hadoop, you know, we can, we can be that platform. I Why should customers call you up? Why should they call you? I all this other stuff out there, got legacy, got Teradata, and I might have other things, people are knocking on my door. Sure. I mean, they're getting pounded with sales, messages, yep. buy me, I'm better than the other guy. Why Pivotal so, Data? So the, the first thing I would say is um, the the latest uh, reviews from Gartner, for example. Well, actually, let me, let, me re let me rewind. I will easily argue that Teradata has been the data warehouse platform for the last 30 years that everyone has tried to emulate. I'd even argue so much is that when Hadoop came on the scene eight years ago, what they did was they changed the dynamics and, and what they're doing now is, is actually trying to um, uh, emulate the Teradata success through things like SQL on top of Hadoop. Um, what that has, has basically gotten us to is we're looking for a Teradata replacement at Hadoop-like prices. That's what Greenplum has to offer in spades. Now, um, if, you, if you actually you know, kind of extend that just a little bit, I, I still recognize that you know, not everybody's going to call us. There are still you know, 200 other uh, part, uh, vendors out there that are selling a similar product or similar kinds of stories. Um, what I would tell you, you know, in response to those folks is that you know, Greenplum has been around in production for the last 10 plus years. We're a proven technology for solving problems. Many of those are not. We work very well on this cooperative spirit of, you know, Green Plum can be the end all be all, but I recognize it's not going to be the end all be all. So this is why we have to work within the ecosystem. I think any modern enterprise. You have to. Is I mean, open multiple. source is dominating. I mean, at the Linux event, uh, we pitched Cover Open Source Summit. Ninety percent of software written will be open source libraries. Ten percent is where the value is being added. And we'll take that. For sure. If yeah. if you were to start up an, uh, a new uh, startup right now, would you go with a commercial product? No. no. Folks stress, database is good. All right, final question was as to end the segment. Uh, this big data space that's now being called data, uh, certainly Strata, Hadoop is now Strata Data, which is trying to keep that, that show lo going longer. Uh, but you got Microsoft Azure making a lot of waves going on right now with Microsoft Ignite, so cloud is in, into the play here. Data's changed, so the question is, how has this industry changed over the past eight years? I mean, go back to 2010, when I saw Green Plum coming prior to even um, getting bought out, but they were kicking ass, same product, kind of yep. evolved. Yep. Where is the space gone? I mean, what's happened? How would you summarize it to someone who's walking in for the first year, like, hey, back in the old days when we used to you know, walk to school in the snow with no <laughs> shoes on, <laughs> both ways. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> how do you, you know, now it's like, get off my lawn, you young, young, young developer. But, but, but seriously, what is the evolution of the industry? How would you explain it? So, so, so again, I would start with, um, Teradata started the industry, I mean, by far, and then, Folks like Natiza and Greenplum came around to, to really give a lower cost alternative. Hadoop came on the, the scene eight some years ago, and, and what, what I pride myself in being at Greenplum for this long, it, you know, Greenplum in implemented the MapReduce paradigm as Hadoop was starting to, to build. And, and as it continued to build, we focused on, on building our own distribution and, and SQL on Hadoop. I think what we're getting down to is a brass tacks of the business is tired of, of technological science experiments, and they just want to get stuff done. And what we and a cost of ownership that's manageable. That is correct. And sustainable. And sustainable, and not uh, in a spot where they're going to be locked into a single vendor. Hence the open source. So the ones that are winning today employed what strategy that ended up working out, and what strategy didn't end up working out. If you go back and say, yeah, the people who took this path failed, 
people who took this approach won? What was that? So, what's the answer? So I would say, I mean, clearly anybody who was in appliance um, that has long since kind of uh, uh, drifted. I'd also say Greenplum's in this this unique position where in appliance too. But yeah. Well, well, so, so <laughs> pseudo appliance. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I still have to respond to that. Uh, we we were always open source. We were always you software. pivoted. <laughs> luckily, before you pivoted. That is pivotal. Um, so so but but putting that aside, you know the hardware vendors have gone away. All of the software competitors that we had have actually either been sunset, sold off, and forgotten. And so so Greenplum here we sit as as kind of the, the, sole, uh, the sole standard or, or uh, you know, person that's been around for the, for the, long, the long haul. Um, we are now uh, seeing a spot where we have no competition other than, than the forgotten really legacy guys like Teradata. People are longing to get off of, of legacy and onto something modern. The, the trick will be whether that modern is some of these new and upcoming players in technologies or whether it, it really focuses on So what on was the strategy problems. that was the winning strategy? Stick to your knitting, stick to what you know, or was it more? So, so it was, it, for us it was twofold. One, it was continuing to service our customers and make them successful. So that was how we built a, a profitable data platform business. And then the other was to double down on the strategies that seemed to be uh, you know, interesting to, to organizations which were cloud, open source, and analytics. And like you said, you know, I, I talked to uh, uh, one of the folks over at the Air Force, and, and uh, he was mentioning how to him, data is actually more important than fuel. Being able to understand, you know, where the airplanes are, where the fuel is, where the people are, where, where the missiles are, et cetera, and that's actually more important than, than the fuel itself. And so data, you know, is, is the, the thing that powers everything. Data is currency, everything now. Great. Shox, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Congratulations. Pivotal data platform, data suite, uh, Greenplum, now with all these other assets. Congratulations. Yeah, stay on the path, helping customers you can't lose. Exactly. All right, it's theCUBE here, helping you figure out the big data noise. We're actually in Big Data New York City event for our, our annual SiliconANGLE CUBE Wiki Bond event in conjunction with Strata Data across the street more live coverage here for three days here in New York City. I'm John Furrier, Peter Burris. We'll be back after this short break.